As you can tell today, we're starting a brand new series, a book study on Ezekiel. It's going to be a lot of fun. No, we're not doing that. It's a series on the family. I don't know if you know that or not. So that's what we're doing. And in honor of that, I I wore my t-shirt of my favorite television family right now, Duck Dynasty. Anybody else totally into Duck Dynasty? Like... I love that show. It is so far removed from my reality. Like, I've never wanted to go out into the woods like a day in my life unless I was being chased, you know. Uh, But like, that actually makes me want to go out in the woods and shoot something, you know. It really does. Uh, It's a great show. But we're talking about family over the next four weeks. I'm glad you're here. And um, kind of as we get started on talking about family, let me just share with you uh, something that's really important. Today especially, uh, it's going to be kind of a, for me, it's going to be a little bit in your face. Okay, Uh, because we have to kind of address some tough issues about families. And I want to encourage you, uh, whether your children are grown, whether you have no children, whether you are considered a child, uh, whether you're in here and you're in high school, if you're in here and you're in high school, today especially, I want you to hear this message. If you're a young person and you're dating, especially I want you to hear this talk today because it's very important that we understand some some things about family. And I just want to encourage you to stick with me. A lot of us in the room have walked through uh, relationships that have not ended the way we thought they would. And I want you to hang with me and I want you to remember from the beginning that we believe in a God who redeems things, a God who takes things that seem to be failures, that seem to, to, to hurt and harm, and he can use them for some great stuff. So I just want you to remember that as we move forward today. Can you do that for me? Say yes. Yeah. All right. Do we have any high school students in the room today? Raise your hand up nice and high if you're in high school. Raise your hand up nice and high. We've got a few. How about you're single in here? Raise your hand if you're single. Single. Awesome. Raise your hand if you're dating somebody but single. Dating somebody but single. Okay, so look around. People always ask me if we have a singles group. We don't, but right now we can take care of all that, all right? And how many married people do we have? You're married, 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 married people. All right, put your hands down. How many of you have children living at home? Children living at home. How many have children out of the house? How many have children that should be out of the house but are still there? (laughs) Children that should be out of the house but are still there. No, no, no. And how many of you are married and have no kids? Never had kids, just for whatever reasons decided not to or couldn't, whatever that might be. Anybody? Yeah, great. So there's a lot of, how many grandparents do we have in here? Any grandparents? Yeah, very cool. Um, Well, I'm excited about this series because all of us in some way, shape, or form are part of a family. And that's what I want to talk about today. Now, when I was a kid, my family, I I think I was pretty pretty privileged. Uh, I grew up in a a pretty good home. It was uh, kind of like the the traditional home you would see on the Cosby show. I mean, we didn't have that many kids and we were white. But other than that, it was pretty similar, you know. Uh, I've always been Caucasian. uh, And and so, you know, it's one thing I, I could do. But we loved the show, The Cosby Show, growing up, and, and, and my family was pretty stable. My father was a pastor. I'm a second-generation pastor. He was a pretty balanced pastor. I think he was probably more balanced than I was, and so I'm still trying to learn that. But I can remember as a kid in my family, I used to, um, we were pastors. We didn't have a whole lot of toys, I suppose, but I had like a deck of cards, you know, and I used to take cards, and I had this phase in life where I would make houses of cards. Did anybody ever do this? Anybody ever take like a deck of cards and, and you set it up just like so, you lay them out and then you can lay a t- layer on top a, a deck of cards and then you can build it higher, you know? I can remember like uh, building whole like single story homes. I was never much of a builder. So single story homes that filled a whole room, you know? And, and I, I really enjoyed this and I know, I, I, we have established this, I was not cool. I didn't have any friends, so that's why I had a deck of cards, you know, that's why I did this, but um, I used to make these house of cards, now here's a really interesting true house of cards, I never built anything quite this fancy, Uh, that's pretty cool, Um, the problem though with a house of cards is you can spend a lot of time making that house of cards, and you have one false move, and what happens, the whole thing falls apart. Right, could you imagine building that whole thing and sneezing? <laughs> right, and that's all it takes. It takes one misplaced sneeze and that's gone. It takes one person walking in the door too aggressively, disturbing the wind in the room, and that thing's falling over. It was such an irritant that that would happen. You'd spend, I'd spend an hour laying out this house of cards and then my sister would just walk by or my parents would walk in and whew, the whole thing would fall down. Now, interestingly enough and problematically enough, is that in our culture, it seems to me that our families have become more and more like houses of cards. That our families more and more often can look like this, 
But the reality is they are failing and falling apart at a record pace. And the cost is staggering. The cost of our families looking like house of cards, so quick and so easy to to fall apart, has a tremendous cost. And there's kind of three big costs that it has to us. The first is that the failing family, a family in that process of failing, and I know that failure and fail and failing is a harsh word. How many like that word? We don't like that word. How many ever got an F on your report card? It's not anymore, because I don't even think you can get an F on your report card anymore. And we can talk about the validity of that decision in our education system at some other point in time. But you can guess what I think about that. But you don't have to think that way to go here. You're more than welcome to be wrong, okay? It's fine. I love lots of people who are wrong. Just look around you. No. But we don't like that word. We've, we've removed that word. But the problem is this. If you're going to change anything, and, I, and one of my passions that I love to study is change theory. And one of the things I know about change is you cannot change something that you have not faced the harsh reality of. And so for the next few minutes, I'm going to use the word fail and failing because I really do believe that's what's happened. And some of you in here, you have had marriages and relationships that have fallen apart and have failed. And at some point, I'm not here to beat you over the head about that. I don't know your circumstances, but I think we need to call it what it is. I have my failings within my family. Oh, trust me. My wife is leading a kindergarten you know, uh, group right now in kids' church, and she'd be more than happy to have coffee with you and tell you about my many failings when it comes to family, okay? And so let's just, let's put our cards on the table, so to speak, here, and let's just be okay with the fact that All of us in some measure have these failings in our families, but what I have to get us to understand at some point is that we can't be satisfied with that. We have to recognize what it is if we're going to make a change, if we're going to move forward. And the cost of these failings on our culture is staggering. The cost of failing families on our culture is staggering. Close to $100 billion a year $100 billion a year is being spent on assistance, tax dollars, on assistance for fatherless homes. $100 billion. The cost of failing families on our economy is staggering. So much assistance has to go into these homes for whatever reasons that end up without a father present. It's alarming what happens. 50 years ago, we began to see a degradation of the family unit and a shift and a change in what the family was going to look like. And that's led to some pretty significant problems. One of the problems that has happened is that people are becoming more and more transient. Kids are losing the idea of having a permanent home. Impermanence is becoming more and more the language of our children. Not only that is we're seeing an incredible loss of of adult relationships. Fewer and fewer adult relationships are happening amongst the lives of kids. Another thing that we're seeing happening because of this is is there's a staggering rate of poverty that has risen because of the degradation of family. Kids are way more likely to end up in an impoverished situation and our culture plays and, and pays for our lack of commitment and lack of understanding of the, the real weight of the family. In 2002, there was a study that was done, and this study revealed that almost 65% of those people in poverty, of single mothers that were considered to be in poverty, would leave poverty if divorce rates went back to what they were in 1971. An academic study, this was not a a, a religious study, this was a simple study on the, the power and what has happened in families and what's going on. Sociologists from secular universities, 65% of households that are considered impoverished because of a fatherless situation, they would leave poverty simply if the divorce rates went back to what they were some 40 years ago. The cost on our culture is staggering. And it's not just simply on our culture, but the cost on our children is frightening. The cost on our children is heartbreaking. The reality of the degradation of a family, the degradation of of what it means to commit one to another forever to honor one another in marriage, to wait to engage in sexual activity because of the potential harms and dangers that can happen. The degradation of these concepts have have really heartbreaking results on our children. And some of you have experienced this. 
what I'm getting ready to tell you, you have lived. But the reality is this. Children who go through a, a, a situation where they end up with a fatherless or they end up with a marriage that are highly, highly more likely to struggle in school, to have problems academically. Children who go through a, a problem in the home and who have stress and, and are under tension at home are far more likely to face emotional and have, and have needs that require counseling and, and some psychological intervention. These children are, are far more likely to have more health problems, to end up more times in the ER, to end up more times with sickness. There's a power in family. These children are most and, and are at the highest risk to engage in tobacco, alcohol, illicit drugs. These are facts. These are studies that have been done, not by the church, not by going, but by, by secular organizations who are trying to figure out what's happening to children in our culture. And they're coming back to find this alarming rate that these are the consequences that happen when we fail in our families. Teen pregnancy skyrockets. The potential for teen pregnancy skyrockets for kids who've come from a marriage that hasn't worked out. These are the potential disasters that take place. And you know what else happens to our children? This is so interesting. They are far less likely to care for their aging parents when they come out of a home that is failed in marriage. Far less likely to take care of their aging parents than children who grow up in a home that has a set of balance and, and intact. I mean, these are real consequences. And not only are there a cost to our culture, not only is there a cost to children, but there is a cost if the church doesn't do something to come alongside and support families. There is a cost to the church failing families. And that cost is a debilitating of the gospel. The gospel loses its power when the church refuses to walk alongside families who are failing, alongside families who are struggling, when the church refuses to engage one-on-one -on -one to create opportunities for families to grow in their understanding of what God has designed that family to be and to look like. And if the church stays silent and the church doesn't do what it needs to do, and we are the church, the cost is staggering and the cost is so problematic because the gospel loses its power. If the gospel cannot bring families together, if the gospel cannot redeem past failures, if the gospel cannot create a stable environment in homes where the, where the marriage has ended, then we have a serious, serious problem. And so today we have to begin making these choices about our families. We have to begin to decide if this is the reality of what's happening to families, what are we going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? Whatever situation you might be in, the cost that it has, what is it that you can do? It's a great story in the Bible. It's found in Joshua chapter 24. In Joshua chapter 24, you have to know a little bit of the context. If you're kind of new to Bible study, Joshua is the successor to Moses. Moses, uh, because of a choice that he had made, was not able to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. And so Joshua takes over, and he's an incredibly skilled commander. He's a warrior, and he's brought the children of Israel into the land of milk and honey. I have had all natural honey. Has anybody ever had all natural honey? It is amazing. It's absolutely amazing. You'll never want to go back once you've had that. In a land flowing with milk and honey, the Bible describes it. And so in Joshua chapter 24, it's kind of the end of the campaign. And Joshua is standing amongst all the Israelites. And he's giving this speech. And he's sharing with them about the reality of what's going on. And in Joshua chapter 24, verses 14 and 15, this is what he says. So fear the Lord and serve him wholeheartedly. Put away forever the idols your ancestors worshipped when they lived beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. Serve the Lord alone. Look at some of these words here. Serve him wholeheartedly. I love that word. Like there is a commitment that is desired by God on the people of Israel. Didn't want them to be wishy-washy. Didn't want to be a Sunday thing or a Saturday thing or when there's a problem thing. God wanted it to be wholehearted. He said forever. Put away the past mistakes. Put away those things that you're serving, those idols that you carried with you forever. So we have this idealized understanding of Israel. And let me just share with you. Israel, for all that we love about it in the Old Testament, never truly ascended to this idea of serving only one God. That's why over and over and over again in the Bible it says, serve the Lord your God alone Right? It's throughout the whole Bible. There was this consistent carrying of these family idols around. Right? You wouldn't be telling people you need to only serve God if they're already only serving God. Right? It's like doing a marriage seminar 
for people who are never going to get married, right? You wouldn't do it. But this is a scenario where it's constant and consistent in the Bible. This was a failing of the Israelite people. He says, put it away forever. Like, there is this intense commitment that God wants. He says, you need to serve the Lord alone, alone. See, serving God brings with it a commitment, an expectation for the Israelites. That's what it's supposed to be. And see, God had earned the right to be a priority. Earlier in Joshua chapter 24, verses 1 through 13, Joshua recounted all that God had done for them, walking them through, hey, God brought you out of Egypt. God put you in the land that you have right now. God went ahead of you and conquered the people that were there. God went ahead of you, and now you live in homes that you didn't build, and, and you, you, you reap the harvest from vineyards and from fields that you didn't plant. And so God, Joshua was saying to the Israelites, there's a precedent here. God's earned your respect. He's earned that, that ability to say, I want to be the priority. And through the cross of Jesus Christ, I think it's the same for us. God has said, listen, I've earned the right to be the priority. I've given everything I possibly could for you. I've shown you the way to have a healthy life. I've shown you the way to find peace and forgiveness and joy to the extent that it cost me my only son. And that's very important for us to remember. So in Joshua chapter 24, verse 15, the next verse, this is what he says, but if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose. Choose today whom you will serve. Two very important words, choose and will serve. We have a choice. The Israelites had a choice. How will they establish and build their life? How will they move forward? It's your decision. It's always been about that. Faith in Jesus Christ and God has always been about a choice. It's the way it was meant to be, the way it was intended. We are to choose and this, this call came out to the Israelites. You need to choose today because you will serve something. The Israelites will serve a God. It's not, you don't have this choice to not serve any God. We may think we do. We may call it agnosticism. We may call it atheism. But the reality is we all establish gods in our lives. They creep in. And Israel was being told a very incredible truth. You have to choose who you will serve because Somebody else will choose it for you. Culture will choose it for you. Your neighbor will choose it for you. But you have this opportunity to choose. See, every Israelite family had a choice. And today it's the same. Every family here at Curtis Lake has a choice. We have a choice to live in those staggering, almost impossible statistics to follow and understand. We can't comprehend $100 billion. It's just too much money. We just can't comprehend it. We can't comprehend the realities of teen pregnancy. We can't comprehend the realities of, of the long-term effects to the point where 40, 50 years later, a divorce could still be affecting a child that they wouldn't want to care for their aging parents. Like, we can't understand that. We've been created in such a way, and our brain works in such a way, that we don't focus on those negative things. We don't focus on the, the hugeness of problems and scenarios. Otherwise, we would be just incapable of functioning. But we have a reality where we have to make a choice. Will we, will we allow those decisions? Will we allow our past failures to determine the future promises that God has for us? Or will we choose something differently? And so Joshua finishes and he says, Would you prefer the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates? Or will it be the gods of the Amorites in, whom, in whose land you now live? Now I love this because this is what we do as well. He says you have a choice. You can serve the past. The way, the way your ancestors did it. How'd that work out for them? The way your ancestors did it, and these gods that had no meaning to them, that weren't able to save them, you can do that. And we have the tendency to do that as well. We go back to our past, we serve our past, we let our past ha hang ups, our past hurts. We let our past problems dictate our present decisions and, and our future health. Is that what we want to do? It's a choice. Or you can choose to serve the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live. And the reality is, many of us just live in the present. We can't see beyond our current circumstances. Our marriages are falling apart. We're not getting along. We think, well, it's better for our kids not to you know, have to deal with parents that are arguing, which, by the way, studies are showing that that is a wonderful sentiment, but just not true. Studies are showing that it's far better for kids to be in a home where there's a measure of conflict than to be in a home absent of a father or absent of a mother. And so we have this choice now. Do we live in, in our present circumstances? Do we live in what isn't working? Do we live in and just say, well, you know what? It is what it is. This is what's going to happen. I mean, those are those choices that we have. But Joshua, I love it. He gives a, another option. He says, but as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. But as for me and my family, we 
will serve the Lord. See, Joshua sets this incredible example. He says, it's the family. It's not just me. It's us, and we're going to serve God. I love the word serve. It's an action word. It's not just sitting around waiting for God. It's being ready to do what God has me to do. Serving someone means that I am putting aside my will, and I'm going to serve them. I'm going to do what they request. And that's a part of this incredible relationship that God wants to have with us is one of service. Not because God needs to get things done through us, but because God wants to do things in us that we can't imagine. He wants to build strong families and healthy families, but it's gonna come through serving him. And so Joshua sets an incredible example for family commitment. Not just me, not just my spouse, not just my children, but families serving the Lord together. Families going to church together. Families praying together. Families making those decisions. Fast forward a thousand years. Fast forward to the time of Jesus. In Matthew chapter seven, Jesus is giving a teaching. And he says this, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. Jesus is saying, listen, look at here. Like if he were Phil from Doug Dynasty, he'd say, looky here, looky here. He'd say, if you want your home to be happy, happy, happy. (laughs) You have to build, build, build on a good foundation. Jesus says that best foundation for the building of a house is my teachings. That's a wise thing to do. Or you can go with culture. You can go with everybody around you. Or you can go with the way it was done before. Or you can just focus and fix your eyes on the reality of Jesus and his teachings. And he gives the other side of this too, right? He says, but anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey is foolish. Living like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. Now, you know what's so powerful about this? That those people that proclaim a gospel that says everything's gonna be wonderful for you when you follow Jesus, they have to cut this passage out of their Bibles. Because if you'll notice, The wise person who serves Jesus and the foolish person who doesn't still face the same storms in life. The problem is, the 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 the, the problem is you're not equipped to face the storms without a solid foundation. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you will avoid problems. Nowhere in the Bible does it say if you just love Jesus and pray together, you're never gonna get into an argument with your spouse. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you and your spouse are never, ever, ever gonna have to take time apart and are gonna enjoy some space. Nowhere does it ever say your children will never yell at you. Nowhere does it ever say your children might not have seasons and sessions where they abandon you and they're angry at you. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. In fact, it says the opposite if you're following Jesus. You're gonna face those things, but because there's a foundation. And so really the truth is this. We build, we make a choice to build our families on the teachings of Jesus because a family who builds on the teachings of Jesus will survive we have a much better chance of success. Listen, how many of you have heard the wonderful statistic? 50% of all marriages end in divorce. How many of you have heard that? Raise your hand up nice and high with me. Raise your hand up nice and high, okay? And then you hear this statistic if you've been around in church, and it's no different for Christians, people who follow Jesus Christ. 50% of marriages amongst Christians are ending in divorce as well. How many of you have heard that before? Anybody ever heard that? If you didn't, you just did, okay? People say that all the time. Listen, Listen, I'm gonna use harsh language, okay? Harsh language, so if you're like under 16, cover your ears, okay? That's bull crap. (laughs) It's not true. Real statistics are showing that families that are committed to the teachings of Jesus Christ, couples who pray together twice a week while holding hands after sharing intimate prayer requests, the divorce rate is 2%. 2%. Families who pray together once a day at the dinner table, and the spouses are praying together, 2%. There's a lot of people that park the car in the garage, that stand in a garage and say, I'm standing next to a car. I'm a, I'm a car. I'm in a garage. Look at me. They go to church, sit in the pew, sing the song, and they say, I'm a follower of Jesus. What are you talking about? You help us with attendance numbers. That's wonderful. But there is a commitment that's required. You can't just say, well, I go to church, I stand inside the building, I'm following Jesus. And our families are paying the price for that. 
because we're not living out the teachings of Jesus in our families. And so here's the point of today. Here's the point of the series. Here's the point of the spiritual emphasis because this is our spiritual emphasis for 2013 and 2014. We are gonna beat this into our heads that healthy families need to have a strong core. So what we're gonna be talking about for a year over and over and over again, we're gonna provide all kinds of great stuff is this very simple reality that healthy family DNA is built, not inherited. You have DNA, right? How many of you have DNA in your body? Raise your hand up nice and high. Stay with me. You have DNA in your body, right? It gave you your hair color, your eyes. You're tall. You're short. You got a small nose like me. That is a small nose, okay? The things that you like, your person, all that, it's, it's wired inside of you. And guess what? You had nothing to do with it. Couldn't change it if you wanted to. I have thought about growing hair. It's not happening prayed about it not happening see these building blocks this dna right says who we are you have no say in it but your family dna you can build that yourself you can choose that yourself you don't have to just take what's been inherited to you you don't have to just take the the poor foolish ways and say oh yeah i'm just gonna keep doing them you can build that and and listen how many of you look exactly the same as the person next to you anybody No, but how many of you have healthy DNA? Most of us in here have healthy DNA structures. The goal of our spiritual emphasis, the goal of this series is not to get every family to look the same. Oh, no, it's never gonna happen. The goal is to get every family, no matter what your family looks like, to be healthy, to be built on Jesus Christ. And how that gets lived out, the tactics that you choose to employ, those have to fit within you and what makes your family unique. So here's the challenge. Choose today to build healthy family DNA. Four fill-ins. That's the big takeaway. That's the big challenge for you today. Will you choose today? Will you choose? Will you make a conscious effort that I have to choose something to build my family on? And maybe I haven't chosen anything. Maybe I've just been wandering. Maybe I've just been going with the latest book or, or the latest comment from Dr. Phil or maybe whatever's latest on the O channel. Is that still out there, by the way? The Oprah channel, or she gone away? <laughs> she didn't die, did she? Okay. Whew. I just, that would have been bad. We just have to shut the place down. All right? So we have to choose. That's the first thing. And today, we can't afford to say, well, I ought to think about it. I just need to go home and pray about it. <laughs> I need to pray about a healthy family. No, today is this day, this moment. It's one of these critical moments where you say, the opportunity is presented, the option is here for me to engage, and I'm gonna do that today, and build, it is work. We talked about this last week, it's work, it's work, it's work, it's work. It's work. Building a healthy family is work. You have to go through fires, you have to go through flames, you have to go through difficulties, you have to change habits. That is so hard to do, but you have to build it. Build it, build it, build it on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And it's a choice today and healthy. Remember, we're not looking for the same. We're gonna be unique, but we have to do healthy. We need tactics. We need strategies for the core things that God wants us to do. And so over this series, we're gonna talk about three chromosomes in the family. Three chromosomes in the family. The first one is the communication chromosome. If you're gonna have healthy DNA, you gotta have a healthy communication chromosome. And this is the proactive side of family health. These are those things that you do that you incorporate into your life so you can avoid the problems. Then we're gonna talk about the intimacy chromosome. The intimacy chromosome, this is something that you do that that provides you stability and trust in a relationship. We're going to talk about God's design for family, God's design for relationships, God's design for sexuality. We're going to talk about all these things because what we're doing isn't working. It's not working in our world, and we have to figure out a way to engage one another and say, I gotta figure this out. So what does the Bible have to say about intimacy? What does the Bible have to say about connection and family? So we're gonna talk about that one week, that chromosome. And then we're gonna talk about the conflict chromosome. Because no matter how healthy you are, no matter how great of an immune system you have, how many of you have ever been sick? Yeah. How many of you feel like, I have a great family, but every now and then I don't like them? (laughs) Right? 
conflict is bound to come. And what happens is when you develop and you understand the conflict chromosome, you have built into your way a way of dealing with that, of dealing with the tragedy, of dealing with the conflict, of dealing with the hurt, of dealing with all that pain and frustration. So those are the three things we're going to talk about, and that's how we're going to build healthy family DNA. And then we're going to provide all kinds of resources. So do that. And then I want to encourage you to make a, a commitment today to participate in this spiritual emphasis fully. To commit yourself, whether you're a single parent, whether you're married and you have kids, whether this is your second marriage, your third marriage, your fourth marriage, your fifth marriage, your seventh marriage, your tenth marriage, your fifteenth? Anybody? No. (laughs) Good. Right? No matter what, will you commit to participating in the spiritual service? If you're a grandparent, if you have no children, if you're not married, if you're single, if you're in high school, listen to me, if you're in high school and you're single, this today is to just, I just want to kind of kick you in the head we got to wake up we got to make commitments that are going to have a lasting positive impact on our lives and on our culture and on our children and i want to encourage you to participate now listen if you're in here and you're that single person you haven't started a family yet participate because god wants to establish a good foundation if you're in the midst of a marriage right now Participate. If you're in the midst of family life right now, participate wholeheartedly. Take advantage of the things that we're going to have, like the kids' night outs. Take advantage of all the stuff that we do in kids' church. Take advantage. We're going to try and have a couple seminars. We're going to have all kinds of stuff throughout this year. Take advantage of all those things so that you can build. Now, here's the other thing. If you're here today and you have a marriage that failed, it failed for whatever reasons. I have no idea. Maybe it failed because it had to, because it was dangerous and life was at stake. It still failed. Maybe you have a marriage that's failing. Commit to participating in the spiritual emphasis because God is a God of redemption. God is a God who says, I can work all things together for your good if you're called to serve and to love me. There's this part in that God can take all that stuff and he can make it good in our lives. Just because we've been through divorce, just because you're in a fatherless situation, just because you might be in one of those statistics we talked about doesn't mean that you have to suffer the consequences. You can still build healthy family DNA. It just takes a commitment and a recognition that if I'm not proactive, these are the dangers that my children are going to face. These are the dangers that I'm going to go through. These are the problems I have to be aware will come about at a much higher rate if I'm not proactively building a healthy DNA in my family. So here's what we're going to do today. Here's the moment of commitment, all right? Now, I'm not going to try to embarrass anybody, okay? But here's what we're going to do. The ushers are going to make their way down the center aisle. We have buckets, and inside those buckets are a white piece of paper and a Sharpie pen. And there are a lot of you here today, okay? Um, So you might have to share the the pens and look around if they run out of paper, all right? But here's what we're going to do. I'm going to encourage every family, each family, to take a piece of paper and a Sharpie pen, right? Now, Not one pen per person, but per family. So if it's just you, and you're representing your family here today, take it. If there's four of you that are here today, just one per family. And you need a designated drawer. (laughs) Well, I know my name is Simon, and I love to do my drawings. Anybody know that song? Some of you heard that song? I have a nephew named Simon. Every time I see him, that's what I think of, you know. Um, And here's what we're going to do today. All of us in here, I'm going to encourage you to do this. Hand them out. Go ahead, guys. Come on, hand them out. Don't wait for me because go ahead and hand them out. So you're going to take it, pass the bucket all the way over. If you're on the end aisle here, uh, I'm going to need you to go across. If you can't walk across for some reason, then person on the other aisle, go over and meet them halfway, okay, or meet them all the way. So we're going to do this very quickly. Here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. While I'm talking, just get started. I want you to draw stick figures of everybody in your family. May just be you, maybe your parents, maybe your grandparents, whatever it might be. Maybe you have a sister, you're an adult, whatever it might be. You have a relationship with a person in a family. Might be strained, might be wonderful. I want you to draw your stick figure family right now, and I want you to write first names on it. Okay? Draw your stick figure family right now and make perso- put personal names on it. All right? You're going to make sure everybody's got a piece of paper. All right, go ahead and get started on your stick figure family. This is a workshop today, all right? If you're our guest this morning, welcome to crazy land, all right? You never thought you'd be drawing stick figures in church, okay? And if you're our guest today, you, if you don't want to do this, don't do it. Doodle, draw, whatever. You don't have to worry about this at all, okay? We'd love for you to participate, but you don't have to, okay? Everybody else has to, all right? 
we know who you are, okay? So go ahead and draw your stick figures, all right? Everybody got a piece of paper, pen. Who needs a piece of paper and a Sharpie? Do we need some in the back? Does everybody in the back? Anybody need a piece of paper over here on my left? If we could help out over here. If you see somebody in your aisle waiting for them, draw your stick figures. Now, maybe you've got grandchildren you need to draw. Maybe you've got significant, and I'm talking about relationships with people that you know need to be there, okay? Draw those stick figures out. Now, here's what we're going to do. In just a moment, I'm going to pray. And I want to pray for a few people when I do that. I want to pray for those of you in here who today you just need to choose to follow Jesus. You've never made that decision before. And you know in your heart that you need to follow Jesus because it's more than the family. It's just who you are and there's something resonating in you. And you understand that you've made mistakes in life and you need to be forgiven for those. And God's been stirring in your heart. And you just need to have a moment of commitment. And so that's you today. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray that God would come into your heart and would forgive you of all of your sins, would give you a brand new life, give you the gift of eternal life, and set you on a different course. And you know in your heart who that is because it's the Holy Spirit who's been doing that in you. It has nothing to do with what I'm saying, okay? Then I'm going to pray for those of you who your families, you're in a tough spot right now. Like as you're drawing these stick figures, it's just welling up inside of you, and you're thinking about relationships that are in turmoil. You're thinking about uh, relationships that have fallen apart, that need to be rebuilt. You're in here, and you're, you're next week going to sign divorce papers, and you desperately don't want to do that. I want to pray for you. And then I'm going to pray for those of you who it's a good season. You feel like you're in good communication, and you're thinking to yourself, I could teach this series. I'm not going to this. I want to encourage you. I'm going to pray for you that God would help you grow stronger and prepare for the storms. Prepare for those times when it's difficult. Prepare for those times when there's more month than there is money. Prepare for those times where you don't have the answers. Prepare for those times when your children, your siblings, your grandparents disappoint you, frustrate you, whatever it might be. And then when I'm done praying, we're going to sing a song called I Surrender. And that's the point of this moment. We want to surrender our families to Jesus. We want to surrender our way of doing family to Jesus. And while we sing that song, I'm going to invite you to take your picture and go put it over on the board. They've got, we've got some sticky dot things that they're, they'll hand to you. And we'll get the lights on over there so you can see. And we want you to just put your picture up on the board there. Your kids, I believe, are doing this as well. Okay? Your kids right now are, are part of Children's Church. They're doing it. And so after, when you go pick up your kids, bring them in here, show them your picture, put their picture with it. And here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna pray over these families for this year. We're gonna take pictures of them. We're gonna create website and we're gonna leverage this and it's gonna be a part of who we are and we are gonna pray for these families. We're gonna make a list. And this is gonna be our emphasis for the year that your family becomes stronger than it could ever be and that your family becomes a light in a dark world. Not perfect, just a light in a dark world. And we're going to pray that marriages that are failing and falling apart are going to be turned around and built on Jesus Christ. That we're going to learn to serve one another, to prefer one another. That we're going to get over ourselves. That we're going to learn to to move forward in life. We're going to pray. And we're going to see God, I believe, do some great things. But it comes from surrendering. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are amazing. Lord, many of us have had poor family examples. Many of us have failed in our families and in our marriages at times. Many of us have had marriages that have fallen apart on us. And we, had, we, we wanted it to stick. We wanted it to last, but it didn't. And we found ourselves hurt. Some of us in this room, God, we've never surrendered our lives to you. And this is that time. This is that moment, God. And some of us, our families are doing wonderful. And we couldn't imagine not being excellent. And Lord, I pray that you would strengthen and encourage them to be committed because there will be a storm that comes. There will be a wind that rages. So God, for those that are here this morning who know in their heart that they need to surrender, ask for forgiveness, become your follower for the first time, I just pray that you would speak to their heart and that today they would choose to follow you, Jesus. Forgive them of their sins. Forgive them of those things they've done wrong. Enter into their life and may they know they've been given the gift of eternal eternal life with you, God. Not because of anything they've done, but because of the cross of Jesus. And what Jed said in his baptism video, that they can walk with you, God, in a new life. Lord, our prayer and our hope is that as families, Lord, we would surrender 
our families to you and that you would strengthen them and use them, God. And so, Lord, as we stand and move and paste our families on a board, may it symbolize us bringing our families to you and leaving them with you and committing ourselves to strengthening them. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.